Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We will get underway in a few minutes. I'm just waiting for other people to join. So although I'll be sharing my screen and uh, I'll be presenting here, feel free to reach out to us on chat. Uh, the chat is open and yeah, my colleague Lipika or myself, I mean, I will be checking back in between also during the session, but anytime uh, you'd like to ask something, you can please feel free to go through the chat, uh, you know, rather than necessarily coming on air because I will keep my sh screen shared. In case anyone like, so uh, part of the workshop will obviously be hands-on and we will have, uh, we actually have a lot to cover hands-on. So if you do have a plan to join in hands-on, you have to have Node.js installed in advance. Uh, uh, Lipika would have shared the, the link earlier, as well as uh, it, you should have um, uh, uh, an editor, a code editor. Uh, you could, I mean, a code editor could, editor could be as simple as Notepad, but we prefer to use uh, Visual Studio Code, which is free and easy to download because it is specially supported uh, for Node and it allows you to do a lot right from one interface. So it would be good if you had a Visual Studio Code, uh, but you definitely need to download Node. Uh, everything else we can do on the on the spot. Uh, you know there are a few additional uh, things that we need, but we won't look at those right away. Uh, you know, I mean, you can just follow along online, and uh, later on you could try those out. We are also recording the session, so the session, uh, and we will upload that. There is a, there is a live stream going on also on YouTube. Uh, but uh, you know we will edit that later. It's not. Uh, it's going coming straight from Zoom, so it wouldn't necessarily be the clearest. It's obviously much better to be in the session. But if you would like to uh, follow up later, you can definitely watch there. Anyhow, we will get started in just about a minute.
Okay, I hope everyone can see me here. I'm just gonna stop sharing for now. Uh, and we will come back to that in a bit. So hello everybody, welcome to the session. It's great to see everyone here. We do still have people joining in and that's okay, they can keep joining in. I am going to go through a few slides at the start. So uh, we, we will do a little bit of uh, uh, you know well, homework before we go through them. But of course, I will not keep that too long because we do have a lot to cover as well. So please do keep that in mind. I'm going to actually at this point just mute everyone and uh, but you know, like I said, feel free to reach out if you can, if you want through chat, you can either contact me or Lipica or just send it to everyone and you should be fine with that. Let me just start sharing my screen again and then we'll just quickly go over what we've got. There is that. Okay. Let me make sure it is pinned for everyone. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's get straight into it. Uh, just a little bit about the assembly to start you off. Uh, some of you might have, uh, well, I'm assuming many of you would have come across our sessions earlier. Uh, for the last, well, since the pandemic started, we've shifted everything online. But uh, prior to that, and of course, it's still running, we are a smart lab and maker space that's based out of IN5 since 2014. So IN5, uh, you know, it's very close to Knowledge Village as well. So many of you would have, uh, would have seen us uh, passing by when you go to, especially those of you in UOWD or Middlesex University, and now Harriet Watt as well. Um, so we are really near Knowledge Village. IN5 is the startup hub for Dubai Internet City and TCOM. And uh, you know it, is, it includes a co-working space for startups and we have our own space there. We are a not-for-profit maker space and smart lab that's based out of there. And uh, we have, uh, we've been conducting free workshops for the community around technology since then. And you know we've done well over 300 free workshops since then. Our workshops get qualified in, uh, into a few different, we have assembly hack workshops, you would have seen that in the preview, where we work with hardware, we provide the hardware and the systems. So when people attend, they don't need to bring anything except the laptop. So that could be covering embedded systems, things like Raspberry Pi, Arduino, and we try to focus on interesting aspects with that. Assembly code sessions are like uh, today's session, as well as others where we work with APIs, frameworks, uh, and you don't really have any specific hardware other than, of course, your laptops. We've also separated out assembly data science. Uh, we've done advanced topics in AI and ML. And as part of these, this series of workshops, which we've done with Etisalat, we've been doing a lot of IoT and data science workshops. And this time we've decided to focus a bit more on something that is of interest to startups, which is uh, web development and working with things like uh, Node.js and Mern. So, um, we will carry on like going on changing the topics. Uh, I will, do want to say that like, okay, this is probably where one of the last times we'll be doing a workshop purely online. We are going to be moving back to the hybrid model where we will have, uh, you know, people coming two and five from the next session that we do. Uh, we haven't announced that yet, but uh, do watch this space. Uh, we'll try to do something hybrid so we can also broadcast it online at the same time, but we have a wonderful space at in five where we will uh, definitely be happy to have you over there. It's very easy to access and it's very easy to get there by, uh, by tram and you know, now events are starting up. So we are going to uh, go back to live events. Uh, our focus, as you've seen, is on smart technology, very different types of, you know, many things come under that umbrella. And we focus also on practical applications. So we don't want to necessarily just do things that you can't use uh, you know, hands on. And we want to make sure that you do build stuff with what you learn from here. So we're giving a little push. This is collaborative learning. So we are learning together. We're not claiming to be a training center. We're not giving you like end to end. This is not a university or a training center where we will be giving anything, but we'll give you a little push in the right direction. And we always feel it's better to work together. So we do like to uh, do these sessions specifically for that. You can find us on social media on Make Smart Things. Uh, that is our mission statement and our social media handle. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, and of course we have a lot of stuff on YouTube as well as on our site. So there are two parts of our site. Members.theassembly.ae is our forum and theassembly.ae is uh, where we upload a lot of the videos. So you can see some of the past workshops, including the ones that we've done for Etislat online which are part of the Future Now program, which is their open innovation program. But all of those have been related to IoT mostly with IoT plus data science or something. This is the first time we are going towards more, uh, you know, startup oriented topics. And this is going to be the trend that's going to continue for a while. So you're definitely going to see more of that. Okay, let's get straight into it. Because like I said, we do have a lot to cover. 
Uh, oh, I think some people are still joining, but that's okay. It's fine. So before we do anything, before we even talk about MERN or any of the other things, I do have to start you off with, and uh, uh, this is a little bit of a history lesson, but it'll be a quick history lesson. Uh, this is a lesson, that, a history lesson that I've been almost all part of. I mean, I was out of college after JavaScript was on the scene, uh, but, uh, but you know, definitely a lot has changed since the days I started coding, which was you know, probably like uh, professionally, which would be at least 20 years ago. Uh, when we started off, you know, the, when the World Wide Web first came in, it was, um, it was very server oriented. Your web server was paramount. Your web server did all the work, you know, so everything that was prevented, it would, it would prepare the HTML. Your client, which is your web browser, and, you know, you still have web browsers, but your client was really a dummy terminal. You know, it would just make HTTP requests to the server and the server would send back HTML. If it needed anything else, you know, there would be no interactivity from the client. It would just have to make another request and get a page again. So, so it was all like down to being uh, the client just being, uh, you know, a passive participant. And then it uh, comes back from there. The, the early days, uh, in the early days of the web, Java applets, Java in particular was a very big uh, proponent of like, you know, where we're going to get more interactivity in. So you had applications. That was the days when you still had Flash, of course, and other things as well. Um, but JavaScript is a little bit different. I'm, I'm, I mentioned Java for a reason, and I'll do that. Uh, gradually, as it developed, like the website, uh, you know, uh, the server side became more sophisticated. So you start having server side languages like ASP and PHP. So ASP, of course, evolved from Microsoft into ASP.NET, where, you know, all the things that you wanted to do, where you wanted to call like application logic, if you wanted to call other DLLs, if you wanted to communicate with the database, that was all done on the server and would also manage your things like your sessions and, uh, you know, user was connected to your server one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. You were still working with the client as a dummy terminal as just something that was like a receptacle for HTML coming in. And all the work was done on the server side. Uh, one of the things that changed, and of course, this was many years before it changed. Uh, one big instruction was in 1995, the guys at Netscape, Netscape, of course, uh, you know, had Netscape Navigator, one of the leading browsers at the time. And they created, somebody there created JavaScript in 10 days. And uh, that's the, the 10 day period of creation is very symptomatic of, uh, of how under like, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, what's the word for that? How, you know, like underwhelming it was. It was just supposed to be a simple language. And in the early days, it was just supposed to make HTML itself a bit more interactive because JavaScript allowed you to manipulate the DOM. So suddenly, like the DOM, by the way, uh, is something that's important. You, uh, that concept will come up later. You'll see a picture of the DOM at the side. Uh, so the DOM is just essentially like, you know, the hierarchy of in HTML, like a table. So you have, it's a tree basically that you have your document at the top. And below that you have the HTML node and everything is in a tree structure. So uh, any HTML that you see, the DOM is what governs that. And the, the great thing about JavaScript first was that it could manipulate the DOM. So you could change, like, for example, you could change the title, you could change, you could identify specific parts. The problem was that all the browsers had different rules. Um, you know, Internet Explorer came up with something called JScript at the same time as JavaScript. And, uh, you know, that was like, it was a long time before standards came in and everything. But the essential thing was that it was manipulating DOM. The reason it's called JavaScript is not because it's affiliated with Java. Uh, sorry, I'm seeing something there. Uh, uh, just looking at the messages. It's not got any affiliation to JavaScript. Uh, it is just, oh, sorry, did my screen freeze? Excuse me for a second. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, it's not called JavaScript because it is, uh, you know, it is got it is an offshoot of Java. It was just created to be similar to Java because Java was expected to be, uh, you know, the leading web technology at the time. So the syntax and everything was made similar to Java, and it it had many different names first. First, it was called Mocha, then it was called LiveScript, and then within the same year, I think in 1995 itself, they changed it to JavaScript, and it's been that way still. Uh, so it was just created because the syntax, it was expected to work very closely with Java. So that is the only link it has to Java. Now something changed towards the end of the nineties and that is something called Ajax, which is asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Uh, and it's a term that you don't hear 
much these days, not because it's gone away, but because it's just become part of everything. Now, asynchronous JavaScript changed all of the, uh, you know, like the way everything worked because, uh, you know, people figured out that you don't just need the client to be dumb, uh, a dummy with JavaScript. You could actually get it to interact in intermittent ways with the server without necessarily pulling a whole web page down. Okay. So uh, it started with things like update panels. So then, and of course it plugged in well with, you know, web services on the server side. So rather than, uh, you know, your client application going and getting a full page back from the server, what it would do is it would make small little requests. The client would be smart enough, like the, using JavaScript, small little requests that it would get and uh, it would refresh small parts. And this could be very useful for, for UI because you could suddenly, and that's how you got all your, like your autocompletes. So for example, when an autocomplete happens, it's not the whole page being refreshed. Before, if you had a dropdown list and you clicked on it, or you had a form which you submitted, everything would be like a server round trip, even with the ASP.NET. So, you know, the whole page would refresh. Thanks to Ajax, the page wouldn't refresh. That small bit of the thing, which is just the dropdown list, would do some work in the background, communicate with the server, fill up the data, and then do that. So that allowed for a lot of data handling that was easier. And uh, you can see uh, JSON is an important thing to note here. JSON is uh, JavaScript object notation. And that is a J that is how JavaScript, uh, so you could say it's the JavaScript equivalent of XML. So rather than using XML, which is a lot more JSON, is a lot more compact. And we're gonna see a bit of JSON when we talk about MongoDB later on. JSON is just a way of displaying data in a document form. So there is a, a lot that you can do with JSON. And JSON was also important to Ajax uh, because JSON allowed you to communicate. So both XML, well, Ajax used XML as well, but JSON started becoming more popular. And uh, of course it was easier to communicate because XML and JSON were the ways that you were able to communicate with the server without necessarily just pulling HTML. Uh, the other change that happened and something that was like in my early days of coding was very useful with JavaScript frameworks like jQuery came with standardized. So rather than say, you know, Internet Explorer having its own syntax for JavaScript or something else, you could code in jQuery and it would be guaranteed to work on all browsers. So jQuery was probably the first step towards like a homogenous and, you know, a lot of the changes we see now, even React, have come out of jQuery. jQuery allowed you to manipulate the DOM very easily. It used CSS so you could refer to particular uh, items in the DOM. So if I wanted to, you know, access one particular row in a table, I would know exactly how to do it. I would know exactly how to address it. If I had a counter on one part of the page, I could update that without say necessarily refreshing the whole HTML. So it made things much faster. And of course it made. The problem was though that jQuery and all still worked on the client side. So it exposed a lot on the client side and JavaScript was still purely on the client side. So that is what has changed and what will lead us up to now. Full stack development has come about because now JavaScript can also, and that is when Node.js has come up. So Node.js allows JavaScript to operate on the server side. And I will talk about a little bit more when we discuss the thing, but what you need to understand is that now JavaScript can be running on the client side. It can be running your database. It can be running your server side and, as well as the client side, uh, which it always did. And thanks to React Native and Flutter or other tools, well, Flutter is going away from JavaScript, but thanks to things like React Native, you could even write mobile apps. So everything could be done with JavaScript. So JavaScript has become like the unifying language. So it's very important uh, to keep this in mind. And so full stack development is more a concept. I mean, it just basically means the ability and it refers to full stack developers are people who could work at any tier on any layer of the stack. So, uh, you know, and that is why it's particularly important, especially for startups where you have common skills, you know, somebody with common skills could handle everything. You could handle, well, we're going to be talking mostly about the client server and DB, which are the core parts of the web application, but you could even have mobile cloud, even DevOps is pushed into it. So even things like GitHub, uh, you know, your source control, containerization, dockers, all of that comes under full stack development. We're going to focus on the web part of it uh, in this when we're using that. And there are many different types of stacks. I mean, MERN is just one of them. Uh, the closest relation to MERN is mean, which is instead of using React, it uses Angular. Uh, that has a slightly higher learning curve and it's a bit more tricky to learn. And uh, it works directly with the DOM. You'll see React actually uses a virtual DOM. So it's, it's good for faster interfaces. Mean is still, of course, you know, which one you choose depends on um, many different things. 
Uh, apart from Mean and Mern, there are also, of course, the old, like LAMP is an old one which uses, all of these use JavaScript to some extent. Uh, this, it uses Linux and Apache and MySQL for the database part and PHP. So that's been around for a while. Django and Ruby and Rails, of course, also use this and, uh, you know, Ruby and Rails uh, are two separate components and you can see the databases that they use. So all of them have their own uh, things and you can choose which one to use. But when you're a full stack developer, you do need to be familiar with all the different parts of it. Okay, so, and that covers a little bit of our bringing up to speed. And now what is the MERN stack? And you know, the MERN stack and what's made a lot of stacks possible right now are of course, is of course the invention of Node.js. And we're gonna see a little bit more about Node.js in the thing. Node.js, as I mentioned, is a revolutionary one, which I think 2010 it was uh, developed. Uh, by a guy called Randall. And, you know, it is, of course, it's, it's you, you'd very rarely use Node.js directly. You'd actually always use Node.js through some other uh, framework that wraps around it. Node.js is just the engine, really. Node.js is the engine, and you'd always use it either through Express or other tools like that. Uh, Node.js is a JavaScript runtime environment for implementing the backend part, and it's based off Chrome technology, so it has come off uh, an offshoot. So Chrome, uh, Chrome's V8 engine was developed by Google and it was open sourced later. Uh, it was built so that you could run JavaScript outside the browser on a server without any issues uh, coming into that. So Node.js has made all these things possible. So Node and Express work together on the server side and the DB, which is also server side is MongoDB. Now MongoDB is also, uh, it stores data in JSON, which is what makes it so easy for it to be used by JavaScript programs. So, and you know, it's very easily imported. Uh, a lot of companies, I mean, I've said used by here, but you'd find a lot more companies that use this. They, it really has become ubiquitous. And React.js has also been revolutionary. React.js still works on the client side, but it has made creating, uh, you know, interfaces on the client side so much easier. And it was developed by Facebook uh, initially, of course, now Meta. And it has like, and you'll see when we go into the slides later on, uh, what we do with that. So I'm just going to check the messages. Uh, somebody's asked, is Angular better than React? So Angular now uses TypeScript more. Angular is moving away from JavaScript. Uh, Angular is like, so there is one of the big differences between Angular and React, as we're going to see later, is that Angular actually uses, it directly manipulates a DOM. So it can be slower in that sense, because React does a lot of performance upgrades where you can directly uh, speed up you know, your uh, the performance because it uses a virtual DOM. Uh, and React has a few different things. I mean, you'll see like, you know, I personally prefer React. I've used Angular very limited. Uh, and there is more of a learning curve for, for Angular, for sure. React is a lot quicker to get used to with that. So you can see the architecture of the MERN stack here. So as we've got that M is for Mongo, E is for Express, N is for Node.js, uh, sorry, R is for React and N is for Node.js. So you can see how all the different parts come together. So in today's application, what we're going to do is we're going to go through each of these. We're going to keep it super simple because we want to go through the basics. If I had to do a full MERN workshop, you know, it could take a day. So we're going to just touch upon each of the most basic parts of that. We will show how data flows through from the server to the client. Uh, but there are a lot of things that we can't cover. We're not going to cover, for example, how to actually deploy it onto the cloud. That's an ex exercise you can probably attempt yourself once we, we're only going to develop on the local machine. And we're going to keep the structures very simple. We're not going to dwell on React too much. I will give you the basics of React, but I will show you specifically how um, you know, how just uh, just the very basics of React, but there's a lot more that you can do, especially with React. Uh, and, you know, of course, Express, we will cover Express fairly well, like, you know, I mean, it won't be end to end, but you will have an idea about that. Okay. Let me just get onto the next slide. So why is MERN good for startups, you know, and startups, because that is the way that uh, the topic that we have, and we're hoping that a lot of people who've joined are from startups. Uh, the one biggest thing is like a lot of startups develop MVPs and prototypes. Uh, this is probably the quickest and easiest way to develop MVPs if you have a client and server on for the web around a single language. So rather than getting people like, you know, you get a JavaScript developer and then you get an ASP.NET developer or a PHP developer and you get, you have to bring them all together. A lot of startups want to start quickly and they don't want to start with too expensive, uh, uh, you know, hiring process. So you could get somebody who's a JavaScript developer and he'd probably be skilled at all of those. So 
you, yes, a JavaScript developer, a full stack developer is more expensive to hire, but it's usually worth the overhead rather than getting separate, especially and not just in terms of the cost, even in terms of like getting to point, you are definitely on there. It's also ideal for agile development because startups rely on things so unlike say bigger companies which work with you know you where, where you can like you can do testing and you can do you know turnarounds where like everything is tested and everything is tested you have qa people and all that you work more with agile development where there'll be new releases every day you know or even more than every day there's quick iteration so mern and all the aspects of mern do help for quick iteration and you can work with smaller teams but you can still iterate quickly it is open source which is a great thing you know okay a from a cost factor you know there's no uh, it's it's very easy to learn while you're thinking and okay some of them like even the mongodb if you use the cloud version there is a pay as you go system but it's still uh, you know a lot cheaper and of course there is a free version as well the great thing also is that it has incredible community support so if you don't know something a it's easy to find resources to learn and b it's easy to find support also so although these are open source it's not like it's a closed box where you will be struggling with code and figuring out everything yourself. There is, there are plenty of resources, you know, and uh, that's a great thing. It's a very short learning curve, and you can very quickly get started. And there's also a huge talent pool now because it's become so popular. JavaScript developers and React developers, in particular, are, are, there's a huge list of people, and it's easy to hire. Even people coming out of college, you know, it's not necessarily just experienced developers. There is a huge talent pool coming through with the work with it, even in college. Uh, apart from that, there are sophisticated things like source control and built-in testing. So even if you're talking about quick iteration, you could like set up systems for that. The MVC style, which is the model view controller style, is great for adapting real-world workflows and working in a structured way. So you can build, you know, even though you are building within a JavaScript code base, you could do the models, and we will be using models and views as well. The views essentially are your client side, what you're doing with uh, with React. And it's easy to scale up when the time comes. So when you've got your prototype and you've got everything and you have to build up, it's not like you have to jettison what you've already built. You can still use everything that you've got and just build it up a little bit more. So that is about Mern in general. Uh, before these are my last few slides, I just want to cover all this so on the basics. And you know, of course, this will come up again. I just want to start with MongoDB. So remember, we talked about JSON, which is JavaScript object notations. Uh, you can see JavaScript object notation on the side. This is an example of that. Uh, if you see that, like uh, any string fields, like for example, name and, and job have to be in quotes, uh, but any like numeric fields like ID will be without code. So that's one thing to see. You can also see an example there of nested uh, JSON. So uh, a JSON, well, you can call it a JSON record, a JSON object uh, is always with the curly braces, but you can see address has its own JSON object. So you can nest JSON objects within. All you have to do is just turn, you know, uh, put add uh, uh, curly braces around them. And yeah, each of the these these key value pairs are separated by commas. Uh, if you can also do arrays, arrays like you can see under skills there. So arrays are done with square brackets. So this is basically all of JavaScript object, object notation. The great thing about this is when this is fed into a JavaScript program. Uh, you know, a JavaScript object could just say object.name and you would get John Doe. So it recognizes it automatically. So that's why JSON is a great way. And it's much more lightweight. If you were doing the same thing in XML, you'd have open tags, closed tags, uh, you'd have a lot more text. So this is much easier. So uh, the way MongoDB works is it works with, so MongoDB, first of all, it is an open source and no SQL database, which means it's, uh, you know, that's the trend of databases, but it's document based, you know, because it works with uh, JSON. Now, it doesn't work with JSON directly. It doesn't store JSON as plain text. It stores JSON as binary JSON. So, uh, you know, of course, that is a lot more, but it is still ready-made for use by JavaScript developers when it comes up. So when you're shifting from SQL to MongoDB, you have to change the way you think of about a few things. SQL, I mean, in general, any relational database, like, you know, traditional. So what you call tables in SQL now would be called collections in MongoDB. What you call rows would now be called documents. And similarly, like you know, like in SQL, you have joins when you want to do queries to merge up, and there's a dollar lookup in MongoDB which does that. We're not going to cover all this. We're not going to look at dollar lookup and foreign key references, but it's important to know these are the analogs. So foreign key becomes a reference. So a lot of the concepts are there. Now, Mongoose is the plugin that's used within Node to access MongoDB and we'll be using Mongo. So it's very easy to connect and it's very easy to write code with that. 
So that's just a little bit about MongoDB. We are going to actually, uh, just last thing that we're going to use MongoDB through Atlas. That's a service, that's a cloud service that MongoDB provides. And it gives you a sandbox, which is used free. But uh, uh, if you do use it in production environments, there is a, pay, a paid element. There is also like, you can deploy your own MongoDB. It does have a free community version, which you can, if you're willing to do all the management for all the things, you could deploy it yourself. But for our purposes, and you know, for many purposes, in fact, like uh, the, the free tier is good enough on the cloud version. Uh, again, the most important thing, and I did cover some of these points before, Node.js is the most important aspect here. Node.js is the bedrock of everything. It's built, like I said, on the Chrome V8 JS engine, which was built initially for the Chrome browser, but it was open sourced by Google in 2008. And that's when, uh, after that, that's when you know, Node.js was developed out of that. It allows you to execute JS outside the browser. That was quite revolutionary at the start because for JavaScript for the first few decades was only used in browser. So this allows you to execute JavaScript on a server, on a web server. Uh, one of the biggest things about Node is that it comes with its own package manager. Uh, I know people who are fans of Python who use pip realize how much more powerful Python becomes thanks to a package manager like pip. Similarly with Node package manager, NPM is a powerful tool like uh, we're going to be using. So we mentioned we're going to use Stripe. So Stripe I don't need to like, you know, uh, import libraries or import code. I could, I don't even need to go and go and browse on the web and find where to find, you know, the Stripe node package. All I have to do is go to NPM and say NPM install and it will pull everything. It will set up the dependencies uh, in such a way that if my project is shared, anyone can just like, you know, run NPM and pull those from the web, you know, even if I'm not distributing. So uh, in fact, I will show you what we've done on Google, uh, sorry, on GitHub. And on GitHub, you're going to see that I'm not, actually sharing all the dependencies. So it's a very small uh, code file, uh, but you could run NPM and get all the dependencies, even though the dependencies are like, you know, hundreds of megs. Uh, I just have to share the code files. And when you do NPM, uh, the node package manager will pull all the dependencies automatically. So I can distribute very easily using that. Uh, the event, one of the big things about Node.js is it's, it uses a single, th a single, uh, single threaded and non-blocking uh, event driven architecture. So that's a very big thing. So when you develop these Node.js, uh, you know, applications, you're not going to be blocking each other. There's no, um, you know, uh, it's all asynchronous IO. So you can set up events. This is, uh, you know, so as you can see, like uh, when you set up, uh, you know, a port listening for something, it's not going to block all the other threads. So it's very efficient and is very effective to work with that. And it responds to events. Express is particularly great for working with uh, Node because it's a minimalist framework that's developed on top of Node.js. It just sets up your web server. So you create a web server. You can see an example of Express here. I mean, this is, the simplest thing, this is how you can set up a web server in Express with just a few things. You import, of course, there are things that you have to do in the back, back end with NPM. You could just get, uh, you know, uh, Express, you just, you just start an app and you could just do a get request uh, that says that anytime somebody comes to your web server, you know, just send them a message saying, hi, your request has been received. So that will just display. And then you just by using that one command that app dot listen 2000 is the port, by the way, um, you, you say that, okay, this is where my web server will run. It's listening on port 2000. Just in these few lines, you can set up a web server using, uh, using express and we'll do it for, we'll set up a few more routes and paths, but this is the most basic thing that you can do. And of course, the last element, we're just going to quickly look at before we go on to the hands-on part. We're looking at React. So React, like I said, React is a, is a very ingenious way of doing things. It was developed by Facebook, which is now Meta, and it's still maintained by them. Uh, it's, it is a component based. And of course, some of you would have heard of React Native also. React Native is for mobile applications. It's not the same, but it is like a similar code base. So you can uh, you know, transpile uh, across. So it does make it easier if you want to develop a mobile app out of your web app. Uh, React is based around declarative uh, UI. So it's based around components. And you can see some examples on the side. It's all JavaScript. Now, React uses something called JSFX. Now, JSX looks a lot like HTML. So when you can see, for example, what's on the top is the React uh, Hello World app. And you can see that it's using something where it's, which, what look like HTML tags, where it says H1, Hello World. And it's quite similar to, H1, uh, to HTML, though there are a few differences. It uses camel case for like for example, class name is class capital name rather than just uh, class, which is used in CSS. But this is actually still JavaScript, okay? It's just been 
fast, uh, you know, it's made it easier so that people think they're working with HTML, but it's actually still JavaScript. And of course, you don't have to put in quotes because it's not string. All that is telling you is that it's saying add a header tag with hello world and just put it into, you know, render it in the document element ID. This is your hello world app, just that one single line. Uh, but React gets a little bit more complicated when you work with components and classes. Components, like there's an example there of a component that you're using. So things like say, you're extending a React component in the class and button cover. This is of course all JavaScript. Uh, you're creating your own custom uh, component called button counter. These components could be stateless or they could have states. States allow and properties allow you to handle simple data. You know, so clicks is the value that you want to store because uh, by default, of course, H, you know, uh, HD, uh, HTML and all are stateless. So you don't have access always to this. This is setting up, there are certain, you can set up events. The render function is very important. Render is how uh, it inputs. So uh, remember I told you also that React writes to the virtual DOM. So React has a component and it's very fast because it's all done in memory rather than say modifying the actual DOM. Uh, so a lot of the things, so the render actually modifies the virtual DOM and it just says, put the button controller, which will be like, you know, um, you know, put the button on there, which button would be defined somewhere else, you know, so button is another react component. So you could define these different components and it will get like set into its own uh, thing, you know, so the button will display like that. And you can set up event handlers, like you can say handle click, uh, you know, there's JavaScript handler, which is like setting the state in this case. So it's actually counting the number of clicks, the number of times the button has been clicked and you're saving it in your state. So the state is actually how you uh, save values like that across and the text would actually display. This would just display as like some HTML which shows, uh, it says you've clicked me this many times and all these values are there. Anything you put within the curly braces, by the way, in React is like, can be, it can be like JavaScript. So you could pick expressions on that. Um, I do actually want to show you something quickly on that. Let me, let me do a new share in fact. Um, so our interaction with React mostly will be through Create React App. Create React, React App is a tool chain that's available on Node.js, which just allows you to create a single page app. And uh, there is a little bit of bloat on that, but it creates everything. And by the time you have it, you have a React App ready to go, you know, and uh, it also creates other things like, so there's a concept of, uh, um, you know, now of, uh, uh, of uh, what do they call there? Uh, you know, there are like uh, uh, web apps that can be, uh, you know, that you, you want to just put into uh, that work like mobile apps. So it will create a manifest. It will create uh, all the different things there uh, that you uh, that you need. It isn't supported by all browsers, but it is there. So it is, uh, you know, it'll create the manifest. It'll create a logo. So in case you install it on your web app, your logo will be, uh, you know, displayed as an icon. So all the stuff it does, and there and you know it sets up a lot with javascript i do actually want to open up this like so i'm not going through like all the and the tool chains but let me just that's my last slide anyhow um just going to quickly stop sharing but i do want to show you uh let me just stop the share we'll come back to the slides later but we don't have any more slides to come back to i'm i'm going to share my screen uh for now I did actually want to show you some things in the browser. Uh, okay, so this is actually your uh, your React JS. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of document. This is from the React JS page, so you can see uh, a lot of how we go with that. This is just the uh, just the first five articles. I would definitely suggest you look at that. In fact, I'm just going to copy this and put it into the chat just so that everyone who wants to see it. Can access that? See, it's in the chat. Oh, where did it go? Yeah. Okay. So React JS, and the great thing is like you can actually try them on Code Pen also. So you can see what it looks like if you open it up on Code Pen. Code Pen allows you to run these things directly, and all the examples have that. And you can see the output, and you can edit whatever you want here, and it will automatically update. Uh, you know, so. You can test out all your React. So this is, like I said, this is the simplest application. I don't want to see that. But you should see these details. Like it does, like it talks about JSX. So, you know, like I said, JSX 
you'll see JSX come up everywhere. So you can see H1 elements and you can even use them in, in, uh, in variables and things. So with JSX, anything that, like I said, anything put in curly braces is actually JavaScript, uh, regular one. So it's very useful and you can see more about, uh, an important thing to see is also state and life cycle. Uh, so life cycle means like there are certain events that call up. So uh, there's something called component did mount uh, you know, so where that's like an event that executes where, and you can, you can interact, you can put functions where if you want to do something just when the component is mounting or when the component is unmounting, when it's being destroyed. So you can do all sorts of, uh, you can, in, uh, you can get the different life cycle items and uh, do that. You can similarly, you can define events also and handle them. Uh, render is just one. So you can see a component did mount and component will unmount. These are two different and you can see the life. These are life cycle methods. So those will be important. So component that did mount is just basically when the page is loading up, you know, at the start. Um, well, when this particular component as part of the page is loading up, uh, you can run certain functions, certain functions. So if you had a timer, for example, like they're doing here, you could forward the timer, you could, you know, you could set up your timer, like you do in JavaScript, when you set up a, a new function, you could do it in component did mount rather than say doing it at the startup. So as soon as the component starts, this way, it makes it all modular, because even in React, though it's all client side, rather than like, as we did with JavaScript, where you have to manage different functions, you can create modular components and they could build up on there. Since I've got you here also, I do also want to show you, um, uh, and we are going to be using this. I'm going to share this. This is actually our GitHub. Okay. And uh, I'm going to share that in the chat. Uh, this is the assembly GitHub. And if you go back, you'll see a lot more, uh, you know, items in there. Like we've been using them for, oh, is my computer stored a bit? Sorry, I'm doing a lot of things at the same time on the computer, so it does <laughs> sometimes tend to uh, get stuck. Please do bear with me on that. Um, yeah, so this is our GitHub. You can use this. I've shared the chat there. Uh, I put the PDF that I use, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the PowerPoint that's there is mern.pdf. But I've also put some other folders there. Uh, this is the client final and server final. So at the end of what we're going to be doing today, both on, so we're going to develop two apps, really, two or two separate things. One is on the client side and on the server side, all the code is there. Okay. So uh, like I said, like I have not put the node module. So node modules, uh, when, when you use uh, Node.js, it creates a, a node modules folder where all your dependencies are put in. And that is where a bulk of the, the, the volume, the data size is there when you work with Node.js. Um, so a lot of it goes in there. So I've not included the node modules. All you have to do is, you know, go to the folder once you've downloaded these and just say npm install. So node package manager install, and that will download all the things that could take some time because it's like, like I said, there are, you know, especially on the react side, react, uh, especially when you create with create react app, it does build quite a big footprint because it gets a lot of dependencies. The server one is relatively, but it also has dependencies. So I've left those out. So the final code, in case you fall behind while we're doing coding along, you can definitely go onto there and get that. This is without the Stripe code. I forgot to upload that. I will upload that also as a separate uh, function later on as a separate thing uh, later on. But uh, for now, yeah, I will show you. Uh, I hope we have enough time to get through to the Stripe one. We might go a little bit over long, but it's very simple and I will show you on that. But anyways, let's get started with coding right away. I'm going to uh, do a new share. I'm going to close my PowerPoint because I don't really need that. Uh, kind of done. Okay. Um, and I'm going to, I've got Visual Studio open already, and I'm going to share that. Okay, I'm going to just share my screen, and you should be able to see it soon. Okay, do let me know if, uh, if you can't see my screen. Let me just keep the... Uh, the browser open as well as Visual Studio. Okay, I think we're good to go. Okay, I'm going to share. Uh, okay, we're still on the browser. I hope everyone can see my browser still. Sorry about that. 
Okay. Just fixing up a few things. And I hope everyone can also see my uh, Visual Studio, right? Okay, so like I said, Visual Studio is where you get started with everything. Now, uh, the core elements, I run Visual Studio in it as administrator. Uh, there are some things that might not execute. If you're running this on Linux, there are some commands for which you might need a sudo. Uh, so in case things don't work, uh, when you're running uh, commands in the terminal, you will uh, you can definitely use uh, thing. the terminal is just a PowerShell. It's basically you could even use a uh, command line. You know, I'm going to actually create a new one. So just to close this up, let me just jump this and let's create. Let's open up a new terminal. The terminal is a very powerful part on here. Uh, beg your pardon again. Sorry, I'm having a few issues with my camera. I might actually just switch it off in case. Okay. Okay, so the terminal is really important uh, in, in Visual Studio. Um, I've actually created a few things automatically. So server is just a blank directory. Uh, these are all like from my file system, you know, and uh, uh, this is like, I have a directory there called Mern and I have a directory under there called server where I will be doing all my work on there. Uh, so what we need to do is like, you know, I just want to get you familiar. We're going to start with Mongo, of course. Mongo, I'm going to use the cloud version. So that is all online. So you don't need to uh, actually do that from Visual Studio, but I just wanted to start you off. So Visual Studio, like any files, I can create files here. I can even like actually link it up to a source control. And it's just like this part is just like a text editor, but the terminal makes a lot of difference. The one thing you need to do is the terminal, you have to be in the right directory. And that's something to keep uh, looking at. So for example, I'm in the Mern directory, but I actually want to work in the server directory. So these are all just like normal commands. So I want to make sure I'm in the server directory before I run any node commands. Node works only on the current directory. And the great thing is like, you know, you can have multiple projects working with that. Okay. So this is what we are going to do. Uh, just one second. I'm going to take you first though onto Mongo, but for Mongo, we're going to use, uh, I'm going to actually come back and you can all create, uh, okay, I've already created a Mongo account. Uh, you can actually see. Sorry, just one second, please. I think my screen is frozen again. I'll just, even if my screen freezes, please do, uh, you know, my, I'm still there. My voice is still carry on. It's just that sometimes I've been having some issues with my camera. So please do ignore that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So coming back. Uh, so this is your MongoDB interface. Like, you know, if you go to MongoDB and you just type MongoDB, uh, Sorry, just give me one second. I'm just trying to fix up my camera so that it does not keep disconnecting like this. <laughs> Hopefully this will do the trick. Yeah, okay. Oh no, I've just disappeared, haven't I? <sighs> okay. Sorry, do bear with me just for a second. Yeah, there I'm back. Okay. Uh, yeah, if it keeps giving issues, I'll just disable it. But for now, just go with that. So this is MongoDB. What you need to do is you need to create, uh, you just go to try free and create a free account. Uh, you don't need to specify any credits. You can just, you know, create an account and get started free uh, with that. I'm actually already logged in, so I hope it doesn't. Uh, you can also sign up with Google. Uh, that's what I've done. I've actually just signed up with the assembly Google account. So I, you have these ones and it is already there and I've already actually got it available. So once you do that, they will ask you a few questions, but you'll be on your way very quickly. So I'll leave that exercise up to you guys. You can just do that. Once you're into your account, it'll redirect you to cloud dot mongo dot db. I already have created a few, so I get this view, but you might get asked a few questions uh, beforehand. 
No, you, uh, okay, somebody is asking, we use local MongoDB. Not for this session. If you want, yeah, sure, go ahead. Use MongoDB. I'm using the cloud version because it's quick to get started with. All you really need is a connection string. Uh, the connection string, if you can get it from the local version, you're fine with that. Yeah. So don't worry about that. Okay. Anyhow, coming back to our session. And my machine is really slow because I am also streaming from it. So I do want to. Okay, so coming back to your uh, database deployments. So MongoDB does allow you one free sandbox in each project. So I've already created a project and I've already created a, a database inside it, which is why if I wanted to create a new one, it would ask me to charge. So the way around that is to actually create a new project. So I'm gonna create a new project. I'm just gonna call it, say, one tutorial DB, right? Uh, it asked me to set members, uh, you know, okay. Uh, the project, okay, actually the project is just the project owner. That's fine. I don't want to actually go into adding other members and things for the project. There is a way to collaborate also, but you don't need to do that here. Once you've done that, once you do that, you have to just click build a database, okay? Uh, you should select shared because that is the free one. The other one's already provisioned for uh, multiple things. So you just click create on that. You create a shared cluster and it'll give you options here. These are all good, AWS, Google Cloud. This is, this is not like your, uh, just don't get confused that we are like actually deploying the whole app to the cloud. This is only for the DB. So you can just use any of these. It gives me uh, Bahrain, which is nearest by. Just make sure that at the bottom though, that, uh, that you do have this, it should be M0 sandbag, which is free uh, sandbox. Uh, there are other options which are like paid ones. If you've already created one in your project, it won't give you the M0 sandbox next time. It'll force you to an M2. So make sure that you created a new project. So just select this. Additional settings, you don't really care. You can change the cluster name if you you know just want to make it something. This so say, let's call it yeah. assembly cluster, for example. Okay. Uh, sorry, I've got a few more comments. You can use any uh, provider. It doesn't matter. They will be provisioning that. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, I'm just going to use AWS, but for no reason other than that, it's just the first one. Uh, so go ahead and use anything there. It is just how they will be providing you the details. Everything else will be the same. Yeah. Okay. So coming back. So I'm going to just create that. And it will, like, after I create this, uh, I've selected everything. Yeah, okay, that's fine. The assembly cluster is done. And then uh, my, and then I just say create cluster. Okay, now after you do the create cluster, it will give you a few, two things for security that you do have to set up. Uh, you have to, first of all, create a username and uh, a password. I'm not going to bother with this too much. I'm going to delete this straight after. So I'm not really going to be, so I'm just going to call it user one, two, three. And my password also, I'm going to be extremely this thing. And I'm just going to call it assembly one, two, three with a capital at the start. Hopefully it tells me, so I'm going to create the user. So let me do that. So uh, my password in this, that doesn't mean that anyone can use it just with the password because they also give you a setting here that if you do a, your local environment, you have to give an IP address and it automatically tells you that you can add your current IP address uh, and it will do that. And then once you've got that, only your server, which is running from this, like your internet address will be coming in there. So I'll finish and close. So now go to the database. Uh, it's asking me to save. I might as well save, but I'm, I will remember assembly one, two, three. Now your database is created. Your database cluster is created and it'll take like about one to three minutes, it says. So you do need to wait uh, on that. Uh, we are going to actually go back to Visual Studio Code now that we've created our database. Our database is just going to be a repository. We can come back here and view. There are also There is also another tool called, uh, called Mongo Compass. Which allows, which is a standalone app that allows you to see the database and add data, but we're not going to really use it because we're only going to be adding data through our app. But we can view data here, so we will come back to this. Uh, one important thing to see is like when you want to connect it to the app, and we will come back there. This connect button is where what is being. So once the cluster is created, anyhow, we will come back to that. 
Okay, so let's come back to our server app. Okay, actually, before we do our server app, uh, you should also do, uh, and I'll just I'll just walk you through that because this is something that could potentially take time. I'm going to actually show you how to create the client app using Create React app, and it will take some time. So uh, I've actually got something that's already built, so I'm just going to use that. But I will show you how you do that. So, oh, sorry, wrong. Hold I want to actually create something in the Mern directory. I want to create a new one. I'm going to call it client test. Okay. So client test is where I'm going to build my client app. So in my terminal also, I should, oops, I should make sure that I'm going to my terminal. I should go back to client test. Uh, well, first I should go back one level and then I should go to client test. Okay. So now in client test, I mean, this is where my client app is going to be created, right? But I'm not going to, I'm going to first create the server app, but I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping first on this side. Uh, the first thing you want to do is always, if you if you are using uh, Node, you want to make sure that Node is installed. And you can do that just by clicking Node-V, right? That tells you the version of Node that you have. So I have 17.6. Uh, if you've installed that, that means you have Node accessing, accessible. Um, the other thing I want to do is, so creating, a, uh, using Create React App is just a single line. So I will actually use something called NPX. This is similar to npm, but it's another command. npx is actually an executor that, so even if I don't have create react app at the tool chain, it'll automatically download it for me. In my case, I've already got it. So uh, it doesn't matter. So create react app is the tool chain that I need to download. Uh, so I could actually use npm also, but I want to do this. And then I want to have to give uh, the name of the project. So I'm going to say test project, for example. So that is going to create my folder. Now, once I do this, you know, uh, it is going to just start off. And it's going to actually take some time because uh, especially if you have a slow machine like mine, well, machine that is now slow, and then you need to wait on this. This is going to create everything for your client app and we will come back uh, NPM. Oh, okay. They can't contain capital letters. I forgot about that. We do control C. Uh, anything in the terminal, by the way, that you want to break, break out from, let me just, yeah, so it says, what I do is, uh, by the way, if you use your arrow keys in, uh, you know, you can go back to the previous thing. So instead of, I'll just say test dash project. So this will start creating a new React app. In this folder, uh, if I go here and I see that it's not created it yet, but if I, you can see client test will automatically get a, a test project under there. So test project has package.json is your basic file. And that's the first thing that gets created with any uh, Node.js uh, Node app. Package.json gives some metadata about the project, but it also gives the dependency. So the package.json, when I distribute my code, uh, like I've done in, in GitHub, for example, uh, package.json is what contains all the details of my dependencies. It says I need this library, I need this library, this library, this library. And uh, you know, package.json will also pull it automatically when you do npm install. So, uh, so package or JSON is where like a lot of the work. So right now, as it started, it's just like, you know, it's, it's going to take some time, uh, you know, it's installing react, react DOM and react, react scripts, but even those have their own dependencies. So it's a large file. So we're not going to wait for this. I'm not going to use this. I've actually already done it. Uh, so right now you can see package or JSON just has this version here, but when you install the things, so I'm going to show you a version of package or JSON. I'm just going to dis uh, disconnect this. It'll be running for a while. So I'm just going to, do control C to kill that. Control C, by the way, is how you kill uh, any app like this. So I'm just going to go for that. And I can actually just go and uh, I can even go and delete it here because I'm not going to use this. So I'm going to go, I've got something called client where I've done the thing with the create, create React app already there. Okay. Uh, so create React app. Uh, you know, I have a folder called client here, which has uh, a finished one, but we, like I said, we will come back to this later. I want to create the server app, but I just want to quickly show you what it creates. So remember I said node modules. So node modules is a huge file where every single dependency that's used by react. So Babel is the, is the parser. It's all there. So everything that is could possibly be used is there. So there's a lot of bloat. You can see that it's probably about a hundred. So 
I don't actually distribute, when I distribute this app, I don't actually give people node modules, you know, because node modules can all be like, if you do NPM install on the project, if I say NPM install somewhere, uh, as long as my, my package JSON lists all the different, uh, you can see package JSON lists a lot of dependencies. So it's got React, React DOM, and even there, so this can be like nested also. So React and React DOM also have their dependencies. All of these will get pulled by doing node install. So even if they don't have the node modules thing, uh, you know, and of course it saves time if you, in my case, I already have node modules, it will automatically. The other thing it does is it automatically creates, um, like I was telling you, like it creates, we, we don't need to bother with these. They, these are like just to make them, uh, you know, these are just so that you can use the apps. Even if you wanted to get like, uh, I forget the term, but if you wanted to have apps that uh, that you can, uh, you know, web pages that you can, you want to install onto your phone and, you know, all the logos and all. So by def default, Node.js creates these, uh, you know, so that they're ready to be used as the kind of, you know, mobile apps. Well, mobile uh, apps that will have icons and all that you can add it to your home screen, etc. Yeah. So the, the key work there, other than your package or JSON, is like, okay, and you can see a little bit more in read in your readme also uh, getting started with this. The most of the work is done. It automatically pulls in some things from uh, in your source also. So it creates uh, a React app. And if I go here and if I actually go to this, this, uh, this folder, let me go, let me switch to this folder. React, React, React app. Yeah, get the latest latest Node version. Uh, you might have some issues with your Node version if you already have Node installed before. So you might want to uninstall Node first. You can get the latest Node version. I think the latest one, 14 is really old. So uh, you should definitely have 15 or 16 uh, you know, from your machine. You can just uninstall. So just go to the Node website and you, can, you, you should get the latest runtime. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna come back here. And I'm going to switch to, okay, remember, I'm still in the client test folder. I want to get, go to client, which is where I've got my uh, client test. Uh, sorry, I want to go to my client folder. And like I said, this is a fully working. So if I go here and I say npm start, npm start is the same as if I was saying node.js, index.js. Index.js is my, uh, you know, so I could do either of those. If I said npm start, So it will run and it will create a, a, a client server and it'll open up the browser. My machine is a little slow at the moment. So it'll give you a few warnings. You can ignore these. These are, and then it starts a development server and you can automatically see, I hope everyone can see my website. So it starts up a server at localhost 3000. So it uses the port 3000. So that's important to remember. Uh, and at the start, you know, it's just a, it's just a basic page. My machine is really slow. So that is why it's taking a while. And so this is your React app, which is automatically created out of the box by Create React. So it has a link, it has everything that is there, but it's just got like this logo and an SVG format, and it really does nothing much. So we can just ignore that. Okay, so we've actually created a client app the normal way in React. This is not necessarily an app that we've not set it up to interact with the server app. We don't have a server app at this point. So what we're going to do first is we're going to switch over to the a server app. I'm going to actually kill this client app because we don't really need it right now. I'm going to switch over to my server directory because that is where all the work is going to be done. Okay. So in my server app, I want to create, uh, I want to, I want to set up, uh, my server app is basically empty right now, but I want to create, uh, I want to create a package or JSON first. So rather than creating a whole package or JSON, if I do NPM in it, and I'm gonna give it a dash Y. So it asks you some questions, dash Y will just answer yes to all the questions. Uh, it will create a package.json, uh, you know, in my server directory. 
Okay, so it says I've already created on there. Now, if I look at my server directory, there's a package.json file. It is a JavaScript and it just has created a simple app. Uh, I've got no dependencies at the moment. It's just given like the license, the description. It's also said the index, the main index point by default is index.js. We've not created this file, so it's not going to be there. Now, when you install, when you work with Node, like remember I said, NPM is really powerful. This is where you install all the disk dependencies. This is where I'm gonna install Express, for example. Right now, this is just a Node.js app with a package JSON, but I won't install Express. To do that, I use NP, oh, this is one thing you have to be careful of. Don't edit the files, you have to come back to this. So I can install multiple dependencies in one line. So I wanna install, for example, Express, right? Then I want to install something called cores. Now cores is uh, just something that you need because uh, uh, you know it's like so it's it's for cross origin resource sharing. So your uh, you know usually there are some settings in websites that prevent you from accessing things that are on different domains. Cross origin resource sharing allows you to do that. So although if I deploy my database to one server and my web server is another, normally by default as security measure doesn't allow you to interact, but cores, the cores library allows you to do that. So it's very important to do that. I'm gonna also install Mongoose, which I'm gonna to use to use, uh, with my MongoDB. And I'm also gonna use something called .env, okay? Now .env is an environment variables uh, library. It allows me to store certain values in an environment variables file rather than hard coding it in the code itself. So I can like, for example, I can set my, uh, you know, my connection string for MongoDB, I'm gonna store in an environment variables file rather than this. .env is a library that just allows me to use that uh, and it's directly setting up. So I'm gonna do this. I just hit enter and it will install all these de uh, dependencies indirectly on that. So cores, while this is doing that, I just to explain that cores actually allows Ajax requests. One of the big problems with Ajax requests was that, uh, you know, that there was the same origin policy that was built in uh, to browsers. So it didn't allow, you know, it made, made it difficult if you have to install. And you can see like, it's actually created a node modules folder with all the things and plus the debug. Uh, and you can see package.json. Uh, since I did node install, it will have, uh, it would have updated my dependencies here. So my package.json is automatically updated. So I could delete the node modules again and just distribute this. And if somebody did NPM install, it would pull these again. So we've done this, but we've not created any entry point. So it says that the entry point for our node application is something called index.js. So I want to create a, a folder. Uh, you know, I'm going to actually create within the server folder, I'm going to create a file called index.js. Okay, now index.js, um, oh, sorry, before I do index.js, there's one more thing, I have one more dependency I wanna install, but I'm gonna install it globally, not just restricted to my, uh, this is something called nodemon, okay? And you'll see how we use that in a bit. So nodemon, my dash G says install it globally. That means any node application will use that, not just this particular uh, directory. I wanna use nodemon, and this is a very useful thing that you can use. Uh, so uh, when you're working with your terminal, and I'll show you how to use it, but just uh, this, it automatically restarts your node server uh, when your code changes. Okay, so while this is doing that, I'm gonna go come back to index.js. I have to write my node code here, which is using that. Okay, that's finished with this. Now, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna use express. So I'll just say const exps equal to, require express. So this does like, it makes sure that express is available and it, it, it stores a variable called express, a const express, uh, which will do that. So I also want to create an app by initializing express. So I just do that with this and that gets me that initializes express. Now I can use this app variable to do everything else I want to do. Now, uh, remember that my client version already uses uh, uses uh, port 3000. So for the server side, I'm going to use port 3001. So I'm going to have, they'll both be on local host, but port 3001 will be my server side and port 3000 will be my client side because React uses 3000 by default. I'm going to use 3000 as that. To do that, I just have to set up something that says uh, that, okay, app is my express server. And I say, just listen on port 3001. And uh, after that, I have to give a callback function. Now, this is a very, very important bit uh, that you should pay attention to whenever you're working with JavaScript. Uh, 
you know, uh, and in fact, I'm just going to hit enter so that I can uh, do show you on this. Normally in old timey JavaScript, you would say function and you put a colon, a colon and you'd say, you know, it might have like a variable E and then to def define the function, you'd like start with, with, with stuff like this. Now the shorthand for this to define a function, and this is one of the very powerful things about JavaScript because you can define functions on the fly uh, and you can execute functions from code. So just drill this into your head. Like this is the, the, this, this, this structure I'm going to get rid of. I don't actually need to say structure, right? I'm going to say, okay, and I'm not going to give any arguments to this. So I'm just going to give that just putting these two brackets defines a function. And then it's followed by this arrow Fun uh, the, the two brackets followed by arrow is how you define a function in JavaScript. And then you put two curly braces to define the actual function on there. Okay. So anything that I want to say, I want to say that the app, listen, remember I said, this is all asynchronous. Now this function is a callback that is executed when the listen is complete. So once your server is complete, I am just going to, I'm going to give a simple message. I'm only going to do it in console log and I'm going to say server started, right? So I'm going to do server started. And when I do this, just going to condense this so that it doesn't look too this funny as well. Uh, when I do this, right, uh, this is just going to going to set up a listener on 3001 and uh, it's going to set up my server. So it says that the, it sets up my server on 3001. And once it's completed, the callback function, which is defined here, will just say server started in the console log. So how do we test this out? Just go here and you type node index.js. When I do that, it says server started. So now my server is running on port 3001. So that is pretty much it. This is it. Like my server is created on there. But remember now, if I, if my server, this actually becomes a bit dummy. If I go and type in stuff, I can't type anything here. Uh, this actually blocks. If I go and change my code, if I go and change, for example, here, you know, it is not going to, it's not going to reflect. This is where node mon comes into the thing. So I am going to just cancel. So I'm not going to use node index or JS. I'm going to use node mon itself uh, to do that. Now, how do I use node mon? Let's go to package.json. Okay. I'm going to configure uh, in package.json. There are a few scripts. So if I will, th these are scripts that are used by NPM. So there's already a script called NPM test would just give that error. And uh, so if I, if I were to come here and I typed NPM test, it would just give you this error that's been defined in the script because it would say error, echo, nothing there. I'm going to define a script here called start. And in start, I could give the commands here. I could go back here and I could say, for example, uh, and again, I have to do that in quotes. I could say like whatever I'm doing node, uh, node index.js, right? Now, if I go and save this and I come back here and I say, instead of NPM test, I say NPM start, it'll start up my server again. Right? And it says server SDSDS because that was the message that I had. But the problem is if I want to change my code, I have to go and kill my server and run it again. By using nodemon instead of node, I can actually use this to, uh, to run my function. Now, if you see here, now, if I go back and I'm going to go back and I'm going to run npm start again. So it actually starts up nodemon and it says here. Now, see what happens if I edit my code. Remember, I said server ds ds. Now, if I go and just edit it back and I just go save, it automatically restarts my server anytime there are code changes. So I don't need to go and reschedule. I can just leave my terminal running and that will be good enough. Okay, so this is the great thing about this. Now let's write some actual code on here. Uh, a, a few things that we want to do at the start. First, remember I said cores, we want to activate cores. So we're going to use cores, uh, you know, and this is how you call on any dependencies. You just say require, um, probably a better idea if I just put this at the top, just to be consistent. So cores is the thing. Now, I've after I've said that, I'll also say, um, you know, I will, I will instruct my app to use cores. Okay. Uh, how do I do that? I say I have to initialize cores. So I'm using a function here and I'm just going to say cores and it does that. 
And every time I do this, you know, it's restarting the server and it does it really quickly. Now, the other thing I also want is I want it to use, uh, I want the app to use the JSON parser. The reason this is important is because we will be, uh, we will be using uh, uh, JSON uh, to send web requests as well. Our payload for our get and post requests are going to be JSON. So it's very important to have a JSON par parser ha handy. Luckily, Express comes built in with the JSON parser. So I'm going to initialize that also here. Oops. And uh, it will directly use that here. Okay. Now, remember, I also told you I want to use uh, a, an environment variables thing. So I've got, I've actually hard coded this environment, uh, this uh, this port here. But if I want to change it, I don't want to come into code each time and change it. So I'm going to use an environment variable here. I'm going to use something. It's just going to be called process.env.port. It's not defined right now, so this will give an error. It will not like you know uh, when I do this save. It doesn't seem to have given an error yet because I've already used that. Now I'm going to actually save this value. I'm going to say const. I'm going to define a, a port. Actually, I shouldn't do this. I'm going to define a value called port, which gets this process.env.port. Or it, if, uh, if that value isn't available, it'll just default to 3001. Okay, and then I'm going to just replace uh, the value here with port. So I'm going to use this variable port. And by now, because I don't have an, a process.env.port variable set, it'll just get 3001 to do that. Okay, now we want to start connecting your MongoDB in here. We've got a server running and we want to get the connection string. So we want to be able to access MongoDB uh, here. Oh, uh, one thing I did miss here, I should have also, I haven't initialized the, uh, the .env library, so I'll just add that here also. So I'm gonna just do uh, require .env. So rather than storing it in a variable, I'm just doing it you know, de declaratively here. And it just says config. So this will create a config file. Now, anytime uh, it'll look in here for, for, in fact, I could just do that here. If I just create a file called, dot env and in that if i define say my port is uh this is where i go and say port is equal to uh, instead of 3001 if i say 3002 okay so any variables that i want to define i would define in here uh so i can just use that on here so this is where it will get this value uh now when it restarts it will actually start up the port at 3002 because it's got it from here so, uh, you know, that is how you can use environment variables on there. I'm also going to use environment variables for my MongoDB string. Now, I'm going to come back to Mongo. I hope everyone can see this. Okay, sorry, I'm just seeing the uh, seeing the calls. And we do need the client. We don't need the client test folder. We just need the. I just did that because I wanted to show you how to create a client. Uh, but React app takes very long, so everything that's in client is like a completed create create React app. Uh, so it's like a starting point. Okay, uh, so you don't need that client test folder. I just did that just for demonstration. Uh, three thousand and one is like a general port. Uh, you know, it's a free port. I'm not using three thousand because that's used by React, but you can use any port. You could use five thousand, for example. You could use 3002 on that. Okay, now come back to your database deployment. My database is now uh, being created. What I want to do is I want to go to connect. Okay, I want to go to connect and uh, there are multiple things you can do here. Like I said, you could go to MongoDB Compass and you could actually see the data, but you should go to connect your application. Connect your application will give you your connection string. What you need to do here is copy this part. So you can just copy it on here. And I'm going to come back to my code and in my env file, you know what, I'm, I'm going to let it just default to port 3001. So let's just use that. I'm going to define my connection string in here. This is just a variable I'm defining. So you can give it any name. You can just call it con or anything. And I'm going to paste this value in. Now you'll notice there is something here. It doesn't automatically paste the password, but I've used like a very simple password. I usually can just type that in. So I'm going to just type in my password here. Remember, this is all server side, so it is not visible on the client side like if you had. Uh, it also creates a default database called my first database database. So this connection string is all we need to connect to MongoDB. Okay. 
and I'm going to keep this here. Now I'm going to come back to my index.js, right? Uh, in my index.js, I have to again also uh, do, uh, you know, I, first I have to, inst uh, like I've done with all of those, I have to install, uh, I have to use my dependency, which is mongoose, right? So I've got mongoose here. Now I can use mongoose to connect. Now, how do I do that? I have to type that in here. So I have to do that. Uh, well, I'll do it before. So this is probably before we do the app listen where the server is set up. So now if I do mongoose.connect, I want to say, I have to get the connection string from my env file. So which I'll get env.con underscore string. Okay. And you can see the server is restarting. It's not really going to do anything because of that. It just wants to, I just wanted to connect to the MongoDB using the connection string. This is not everything, but it's just like, uh, oh. let's go quickly check the messages. How do we do it to local MongoDB? You need to get the connection string for your Mongo, local MongoDB. And you do that. Uh, you can just check online exactly how to do that. Uh, it should be fine. So anyhow, our server started with a connection on here, but I also, uh, the, you know, I'm going to also, this this value, this connection, I'm going to store it in a var variable called connection. So I'm going to just get that from connection. So it's been connected to the database there. And I'm going to, I'm going to send, uh, this is, this is what uh, you can just think of it as an event. This is actually something called a promise. So Connection dot once is a JavaScript event, so you can see the, the 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 things also. Like once is actually a promise that it makes that once, uh, you know, that the first time like your database registers an open event, you know, the connection is open. Once the connection is open, you want to define a callback that will be executed. And again, I'm going to use the same structure. Remember that, and I'm going to define a a console log here. I'm just going to go console.log, just say database connection set, right? For example, uh, this is my command. So all this does is this executes only once. So rather than running every time, so every time the connection opens, it will be saying that. And you can see NodeMon has automatically done that. So on the console log, we are connected to the database at this point. But how do we use the data? Remember, our database is completely empty, okay? We could go and define models on uh, on uh, the MongoDB you know, using their interface, but we're gonna do it only in code. How do we do this? We're gonna create models in here, okay? So let's we're gonna create a folder called models and we're gonna create some simple data here. We're only gonna use user data because we don't have too much time. Uh, we are gonna definitely be going over time, but we will quickly do this. What we want to do is we want to create models. Now, every model that you create, so I'm going to create a file called user.model.js. Okay. Now, this is a JavaScript file. Uh, again, I want to use Mongoose, so I'm going to do require Mongoose here. Right. And I want to define, like, you know, uh, a user schema here. I want to have a user schema, so I'm going to do user schema is equal to new mongoose dot schema. So you can see the autocomplete. It's got like automatically on there. I'm going to define that here and I have to define a, a record there. So I'm going to use curly braces, right? First, uh, my user schema is just going to have a name, right? A name, I'm going to give it like simple stuff. Like I'm going to just say uh, it's a type string uh, it is required. I don't, you know, so you can't leave it blank and it is going to be unique also. So you can't have multiple. So this is how you can define this here. And this will all be reflected onto your uh, database automatically. You have to be very careful with the curly braces, by the way, because it can get, everything can go wrong. Now, my second variable is age. Age is a different one. Age is not a string. Age is going to be a number, right? And I'm also going to call it as required, okay? I'm not gonna make it unique because age can be repeated. We can have multiple 20 year olds, for example. And I'll just give another field, maybe like email, right? Now email is again string. 
uh, I can put different types of, uh, you know, uh, validation here itself so that, you know, the database also valid. I'll do trim, for example, trim means it will remove any trailing spaces. Uh, I'll set a min length so that like, okay, an email should be at least four characters long, right? So that is all done with this. So this is our schema. And uh, you know, I want to make sure that I've not missed a bracket. So I'm just doing that. Yeah, so this is our schema that's been defined, right? So this is going to be synced onto our database. So we've not created anything on the database directly. We're going to do it all through this application. So I've created the schema. Now what I need to do is I need to create an, a, a model. So I'm going to create a user model, which uses this. And again, these are all functions from model. And I'm gonna call it like, I'm gonna call, I need to define a collection here. I've not defined any collection. Collection, like I said, is a table uh, in MongoDB. I'm gonna call a user table called users. And I'm gonna use the user schema to define that. So that'll create the table automatically. So even though it doesn't exist under my database, it'll automatically get created. On there. Now, last but not least, at any time you create a file like this, you should do a module.exports so you can use it in other directories. I want to use my user model in my index.js. So I by doing this line, I get it uh, set up in there. Okay. So now that I've done this, uh, I have to come back to my index.js and use my model, right? So I've defined my model there. Uh, sorry, just give me one second. I just want to make sure that I've done everything correct here. Sorry, just give me one second and I will be I'm just doing a quick validation check for my models. I just want to make sure that they look they're exactly the same. Yeah, I think it's fine. Okay. The link of the YouTube stream, you can go from the side. It will be, we'll share it later. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just coming back to Visual Studio Code. So now my server is being created and I want to use the model in the index.js. Okay, now remember, this is my server side thing. I'm basically building an API on the server side. I want to set up API endpoints. So I want to set up functions that if people say localhost colon 3000 slash users, they can get a list of all the users and that can be used programmatically, okay? So I'm setting up my API endpoints here. Uh, the first thing that, the way to do that is by setting up routes, okay? Uh, what we want to do first is, let's come back to index.js. We've not used the model yet, but we will use it in a bit. Uh, let's come back to uh, this one, uh, to index.js to make API requests. We've got index.js already open. Now, before we do this, I want to create, um, Again, these files don't actually exist yet, but I will be creating them. So under here, I'm going to create a router for users. So when I do this, I want to get a list of users. I will be using this as my route. So I'm going to do, oh, sorry. Colon dot slash. I've not defined this path yet, but I will be doing that. Routes at users. So when people come to localhost slash, uh, you, you, you know, this is where the file will be. So I'm going to show you how to set that up. It'll give you an error right now because the file doesn't exist. So don't worry about that. Uh, but by the time I change it around and I wanted to actually use this, I'm going to do it here. See what's the best place. I'm going to probably do it just before I do my app listen. So I'm going to instruct the app to use whenever somebody uses, you know, go uh, types users, use the users router function, which we haven't defined yet. So this sets up the routes. It says that whenever somebody goes like from localhost 3001, when it does slash, it'll go to index.js, like it'll execute index.js, but when they go to slash users, it'll go to that endpoint. So this is one particular endpoint that we want to use here, okay? So now I have to create that file that I've like added on here. which I've created here. So now I have to create a folder. I'm going to create a directory 
called routes. And under routes, I'm going to create um, that same folder. It has to have the same name there, right? So I had it as users. So I'm going to call it as users.js. So this is how you can see. So we have separated out the models. We separated out the routes. Uh, we're making it all very modular. And these are the best practices. You could technically just do all this in app.js itself, I mean, index.js, but that's not a best practice. So I'm going to create users.js here. This is my route. So now I have to create this, this file. How do I do this? So the first I have to, like, as always, I start off with, an, I'm going to use the express dot router. And I'm going to save it as a variable, right? And when I do this, uh, I just have to, this is just the bare minimum that you need to do to create a router. Just these few lines, just use the router and just, you know, export the router. Now my code will actually, uh, you know, the error that I was getting will go. If you see that now it says database connection. So it's, it's been set up, right? So if I go there, if I go back to my browser, I can actually try opening that up. I can say localhost 3001 slash users. It'll show me nothing because I've not really created anything, right? I've not done a get request, but it is actually responding on there. So my browser, my server is running and now I've got to actually start putting in stuff here, okay? So now how do I do this? Now I need to actually define this, this function. So the error will has gone, but we are still not obviously getting there. So I go and define router, this is slash. Now this is relative to users. We're already inside users. So it means users slash. Uh, if someone does, and I want to, I want to set it to handle a GET request. So if somebody makes a GET request, this is where I set up what to do. And again, my GET request, I have to set up an event handler. So what to do when the GET request is called, okay? How do I do that? I set up a new function, again, with the same structure. Uh, I wanted curly braces. Be very careful with that. Oh, sorry, I did not close the button bracket. Okay, now I want to set up my handler here as in what to do with that. What I want to also do is like, uh, I have to set up some function arguments before we had blank function arguments, but I'm going to set up req.res. So any get request normally has returns these two. So req is the request and res is the response. So any get request, when you use HTTP requests, they return this. So REQ and RES are what, what are going to use uh, the things there. So I want to actually, um, well, I did not set up my, sorry, just one second. Okay, I have to add one more line if I want to use my user model. So what I have to do there is this. I come here below this part and I say, let user, and again, I use require because I'm using an external file. This is my model file. I'm gonna use the model file from that folder, model slash user.model.js. So this gets me a variable. I'm not using const here, I'm using let. Instead, it's it's pretty much, I could use a const here also, it would work on there. Uh, now, what I haven't finished defining here, that is why it's giving me an error below. Uh, just a second, please. Yeah, so what I wanna do is, I have like set up my router to get, uh, do this get request from an HTTP request, but I wanna set up so that it handles it. So router is a function, which is why it doesn't allow me to do that. Uh, so, Sorry, this uh, this should be router.root rather. That's the function. Apologies for that. So just make sure. And I'm going to use my model to find all the users. So user.find is a function in MongoDB, uh, in Mongoose that gets me all the elements in that schema. You know, so it gives me, uh, this will give me basically all the users I have. So again, I'm going to set up a chain here. The first thing to do is, uh, 
you know, then is like once this function, once find completes successfully, how do you do that? So I'm going to store my values users into, uh, you know, whatever is returned by users. I'm going to just put that into my response. So it'll automatically ins insert all the values of users, which will come back from my model, which have been found into users. And I'll also add a catch uh, in case there's an error. Uh, these are also functions. It, it just assumes that error is the is what is being returned. So you have to be, uh, so all I'm going to do is just set a status to 400. So it'll give me a 400 error if there is an error. And I will just like, uh, you know, just copy the body of the ERR as it is. So this is again shorthand for function. This means that ERR is what's been returned to the function. Uh, so it will just directly be uh, carried on there. Okay, so it's just going to do that. Uh, do I need another bracket here? Yeah, so I set up the bracket. And where have I done something wrong here? Oops, sorry. Do an extra bracket there. Ignore that, please. <laughs> yeah. So what this does is that anytime somebody goes to the root, the database is going to pull from user and it is going to uh, you, you know get from the model. Now, how do we test this out? Right now, our database is empty, so it's not going to have anything. If we come back to this app, is line six written correctly, json.users? Yeah, that's correct. That's the race. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Uh, this is uh, this is basically just filling in the value. So you wanted to understand that it is correct that it is going to be setting the response and it is going to be setting uh, JSON users. So yeah, I should actually do apologies. That is incorrect there. Thanks for the heads up. But if you come back to your your code here and you go in here, now you're getting a blank array. Okay, uh, because we haven't added any users in here. So we could actually go to, um, you know, we could go and like set up users manually uh, going to the database. Now, if you go back, let's go back to the database on MongoDB. So we have connected the, so let's browse the collections. So my first database has users like you can see it's automatically been created but it's empty right now so we can't if we want we could insert a document from here um but you would have to be very careful so i'm not going to do it here instead we'll insert from our projects but you can see uh it is getting the the value back but we just don't have anything so how are we going to add a project add a project onto uh, sorry add a user onto here let's go back to postman uh, I'm going to use a tool called Postman that actually uh, does all this. I'm just going to stop sharing for one second and reshare. Uh, let me start up Postman. The model file, all the all the files, by the way, are in uh, are in the, the the GitHub. So if you want to access those, you can directly get it from there. Sorry, Postman's just taking a little while to log on. Uh, okay, now it's on. I'm just going to share. So Postman is a great tool that you can use to actually test out API endpoints, and you should do that. I'm just going to share my screen again. Okay. Now, again, like I'm going to use this if, uh, so this is the endpoint that we sent. Now, if I do send, I get back a value. So like we saw even in the description. So Postman does, is getting me, it's saying 200. Okay. So we know that it's working. So our endpoint is returning. It's just that our table happens to be empty. Now, what we need to do is we need to set up another endpoint that causes a post request so we can add uh, data on there. 
how do we do that? So let's come back to our uh, users, users. Uh, let's go back to users.js, right? And I'm gonna add another root here. And this time it won't be for that. I'm gonna add for add. So this will be users slash add. And this will be a post request, not a get request. Now with the post request, you need to actually send some data towards it. So that we will see later. Again, I'm just quickly going through this because we do are running short on time also. Now here, I'm going to create a new user again using the model. So I'm just gonna do user. And again, this is not a great practice that I'm doing here. I'm gonna just assume that the request is coming. You normally, you should do some validation that your user, the request body that's coming in, uh, you should check that it has the correct values and all. But since we're running short on time, I'm just gonna assume that the request body is coming perfectly and it's coming with all the user details that we need. Okay, now I'm again gonna use new user. This user function is all, this is the model that we used. So I'm just gonna use new user dot save. This, this will actually save to the database. Uh, and I'm gonna do then, and my then function, again, I'm gonna define a callback in here that just says, we don't really need to do much here. So I'm just gonna say user added. And uh, I'm gonna leave out the catch because we, we know that if there's an error, there will be an issue. Uh, so I'm just gonna leave out the catch part. You can add and catch and just say, give like, like we did at the previous one. Uh, but I'm just going to leave that out. Okay. So now this would actually, like anytime you do add, it'll actually do, uh, you know, it'll, it, 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 if you do a post request, it will do add on there. Okay. So how do we do this now? Let's come back to, uh, to Postman. Okay. So in Postman, I hope everyone can see Postman, by the way, also. In Postman, what we have to do is we have to first switch. Like that was a get request. We shift to a post request, okay? So now our post request, instead of users, I'm gonna say users slash add, because that's what we want. But for a post request, we need to send it some payload. We need to give it a file. We need to give it a user, basically. How do we do that? And this is where, uh, remember, we, we use the JSON parser. The JSON parser, actually will be will be parsing the info that's coming on from here. If we didn't use the JSON parser, uh, whatever we send it here would be unintelligible. So we want to send it a body and we want the body to be raw. Okay. By default, the body will be none, but I want to set it to body equals raw. Okay. And I, uh, it might have a few different settings. I want to make sure that the setting is JSON. So this ensures that it sends a JSON body to our function. Now I'm gonna use, uh, this is how you have to define it, by the way. Uh, in this case, the field name should also have quotes, by the way. So you should have name, John, uh, the number of values don't need that. So I'm just gonna give John age 25 and ABC on there. Now, if I go and I hit this post request, you're gonna see a 200 okay, and it returns a status. It says user added. Now, if I go back and I run my get request again, for add, and I say send, you'll actually have an entry there. So we have successfully set up endpoints to both add a request, add a user, as well as retrieve a user, yeah, and display all the users. So this is pretty much it for our server part. You know, this is it. This is what we wanted to set out to do. We wanted to set up two server endpoints that actually add a user, as well as uh, get the list of users back. This is all going to be done in so you know, these endpoints will be available to our client side. So now we're gonna switch over to client side because we are running behind. I hope to finish this up in less than half an hour. It does work uh, pretty quick. But now that we've set up our endpoints, let's go back to doing this, okay? We don't need to use uh, Postman anymore. I'm just gonna close this. We're gonna just come back here. Now let's come back to our client app, okay? So our server is already running and we've already tested it out. It is returning and it is allowing us to add. Now we want a client, uh, client side interface that will allow us to call these functions from, a, from, a, from the browser. So how do we do that? Uh, the first thing is we need to switch projects. I don't want to close this terminal because I want to keep my server running. Luckily, Node.js lets us run multiple server, multiple. So I can quickly switch between my two terminals here. I just have to hit plus and I can do this. 
and I, it's the equivalent of like running two command prompts on there. Okay, now, but I want to come into my client folder. So remember, I've already created my, uh, my, my, uh, you know, all my stuff in the client folder. And I'm going to actually close this so that I don't get confused uh, because these are all server fun functions and I've created everything on there. Let's close all this. Now let's come back to my client function. Now Node.js, we had done, created this using create react app, but it creates a lot of, uh, you know, junk files that we don't really need. Uh, we're, I'm gonna get rid of quite a few of these. Uh, I'm gonna get rid of, I'm gonna get rid of logo.svg. I'm gonna get rid of report web. I'm gonna get rid of set. I'm even gonna get rid of the CSS because I don't really care about the CSS here. Uh, and I'm gonna get rid of app.test. App so I'm just gonna hit delete here. And it's just going to delete all of those. Uh, at this point, my you know because I've got a few references, I do want to. So I'm going to also delete them from my package or JSON. I don't need web vitals. So I'm just going to delete that because I just removed that. The testing library. I mean, I can leave that in. It's not going to create any issues. I just don't want to use it, so it doesn't matter. I only just for the sake of this thing, simplicity. I just want to keep my app.js and index.js there okay uh now the first thing i'm going to do is first yeah let me just uh in these two files in index.js so i have deleted index.css so i'm going to get rid of that i've deleted report.web.webvital so let's get rid of that as well uh what else do i have so app.js actually i'm not really going to use index.js let me also explain to you how the code works i'm not going to use logo.js so so okay let me quickly show you how this works. So remember, we've already seen, uh, and I said at the start, now, if you want to run this, we have to just do, oh, did I accidentally? Oh, it undid my delete. So I'm just going to, uh, I just hit Control Z by mistake. I'm going to delete those again. Okay, so I hope it's not. Remember, this is now a working app.js, uh, you know, uh, thing. So I'm going to come back here and I'm going to hit npm start. So remember, I showed you at the start how it works, like it runs the server. And on localhost 3000, we directly see. So it starts a development server. And it's running here. So we've actually got two node servers running. One is using React and one is using uh, this one. The React one obviously is a little bit slower because uh, it is client side, client based. But once we do this, that page is visible. Now, let me explain to you how this works. Oh, something is the report where I deleted something that is not okay right now. I, uh, there is a line that I need to, def uh, there is a line about report vitals. I need to get rid of that from the end. So that is also extraneous. And yes, in app.js, I'm also going to get rid of, um, I'm going to actually get rid of all the stuff that we have here relating to. As you know, I'm actually going to get rid of all of this. It's going to call it React app. What is it saying? Browser doesn't contain a valid radius. All right, I don't have an app.css. I can just get rid of that also. Okay, so this creates up a, so now our React app, I've just boiled it down to the complete basics. All it does is it displays a header tag that says React app. How does this work? So index.js is, is actually just the wrapper one. It's our entry point. We're not gonna be using that. We're not gonna be modifying this. All it does is it does the, in the react.dom.render, it just adds an app uh, you know, component here in the React Stores. So it will just insert the app component, whatever we modify from there into the React DOM and which will again then be modified there. So all the real work is being done on this app.js and what it renders, okay? So app.js is just a function here. So it's not a you know component in that sense. Uh, 
you can define it in this way. So app.js just simply returns the value. It has a div class. This class name also actually doesn't. And you can see, uh, you know, in HTML and CSS, you would use class, not class name. So this is what tells you that this is actually JSX. So all it does is it changes here. So if I go and change here, React app with basics, and I go and change this, and I save, and you'll see React actually quickly uh, downloads. It's automatically changed whatever's here. So any changes I make here are going to be reflected on there. Now I want to connect this to my uh, to my server. Okay, I want to be able to access my server from here. So how am I going to do that? First thing, I'm going to stop this execution because I need to add a few pro. Uh, report web vitals. You don't need to worry about that. Sorry, I'm just looking at the chat. Uh, it is an added feature that comes with create uh, and it gives you like performance stats, but we're not going to really use that. So I'm just removing that so that we're not distracted by it. Okay. Now I'm going to just actually stop my server. And in here, what I'm going to do is I want to actually use something. So there is a library called Axios. Okay, which in the which which allows us to uh, to easily. I could use fetch. Fetch is built in with React uh, with with Node.js, but I want to use Axios, which makes it really easy to call endpoint call APIs from here. Okay, so I'm going to use this library called Axios, right? And I'm going to use. Uh, Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to use Axios and I'm going to just, first of all, I want to add it to my project. So once I do NPM install Axios, Okay, so now I've created, I've added Axios automatically on there. If you go to the package.json, you'll see Axios is mentioned. I'm gonna add another thing in my in my script. So remember, this is the key thing, like this is our client app and we've already created a server. Do, I don't want to, every time I refer to my server, I don't want to have to say localhost colon 3001. So I'm gonna add, a, there is a variable here that you can add uh, called a proxy, okay? And I can define where my server exists from here. Okay, so I'm going to say localhost colon 3001. And I'll show you how to use this later on. But this is put into your package.json so that you can automatically, uh, you know, you don't have to mention localhost 3001 each time. Now we want to start creating our React app. Okay, so how am I going to do this? I want to create a React a, you know, component which has my user list, which is going to store my user list. Okay. I'm going to, so how do you create a React component? I'm also going to minimize, just make sure you don't go back into server on there. So what I want to do first is I'm going to create something in my source folder called a user list dot JS. Okay. Now user list or JS is my component, which will display all the users. And I'm going to use that in app.js to display. So this component is going to be tracked into app.js. Right now, app.js doesn't that. Now, how do you start off with any of these uh, React apps? You start off with uh, importing React. So unlike there where you use, uh, you know, in Node.js you use, in this you can use import. And I'm going to import component from my, uh, so remember I've already, this is coming from libraries that are already there. Remember there I did, uh, in Node.js I did requires, in uh, React you can use import. And I'm also going to import Axios from the Axios package. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to create my first component. I'm going to create a class called user list that extends component, right? So the first thing I want to do in this component is I want to define a state which will, which will contain my user list uh, by default. It is just going to be an empty list. Uh, so I'm just going to, it's a, it's my users and I'm just going to create an empty array. Okay. So my empty array is there. What I want to do next here. Is I'm going to, I'm going to use one of the life cycle events, which is the life cycle functions. And I'm going to overwrite that, which is component did mount. So if I just, it, in the autocomplete, it's there, it'll automatically uh, signal out. 
and I just want to define what I want to do. I want to call a function called get users. Again, I've not defined get users, so this will give you an error at this point. I want to call a function called get users in component dot, 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 uh, did mount uh, that will update my state with all these values from the database, from the, sorry, not from the database, from the server side endpoint. So now I have to define my get users function. So I do that in a similar way. Again, we are going to use a similar syntax that like we've done in JavaScript there, right? I'm going to uh, do this as, um, as I'm going to define, I'm going to use Axios. So like we use Postman here, I'm going to use Axios to do this programmatically. Uh, let me do it on the next line just so that it's clear. Uh, you know, I could actually put this all on the same line, but it's more readable if I do this. So Axios is going to refer to, remember I've already defined a proxy, so I don't need to do localhost. I'm only going to do slash users. That was the endpoint uh, in my server that give me, gave me all the users that are in there, okay? So what I'm going to do is just going to set it up so that uh, I have to, I'm going to set a callback so that when it responds with a response, I should set up a function to handle that. Right? So if res.data, so if the response you've got from this call is actual data, then let's set the state of this component to the values. Okay, so this will do that. I can set up a catch also if there, and which sets up an error, but I don't really want to bother with that. Uh, I'm just gonna do that. So this simple statement just says that when I, that it will call the get on that slash users, which we've already set up as our endpoint. Uh, and of course, you'll notice I, I'm not mentioning localhost because I've already set up a proxy. And when it returns a response, it'll give me this, the res data, I'm automatically going to set it as the state, which is get users. So this will be executed when the component is mounted, right? But we also need to set up some rendering so that this component is rendered. So let's do that here. Okay, so render, function. So I'm going to uh, here, and again, like, you know, the, uh, if you were, if you're used to programming, you, uh, you know, uh, this might seem a bit counterintuitive because your state is actually like, it has to be refreshed within the functions, you know? So I actually have to get back the value of the state. It's not going to persist like a variable, like other code does. Right. So I do that. I've got the state back in my render, but I want to actually uh, you know, display this. So I'm going to do it in the form of, uh, uh, okay, I have to, uh, I'm going to write some JSX here that actually displays it. So um, my JSX, I'm writing it pretty much like HTML. So I'm going to give it a header tag. And uh, I'm going to put an unordered list uh, in there. And within the unordered list, the good thing is though this is JSX, because it's like HTML, all the fill, it's automatically being filled out. Now I'm gonna do some programmatic stuff here. So, we, so I'm gonna put it in curly braces within the JSX. I wanna run like for each entry in users, I'm gonna use the map function, okay? Now map is a function like for each, right? Uh, I have to define that. So for each user, I want to be really careful here because there's a lot of, uh, you know, I want to make sure that my, my, all my, uh, you know, I don't write any extraneous brackets because that will completely ruin my code. So I want to just make sure that I'm doing this uh, correctly. So again, we have to define what it does this. So, so the way map works is that, uh, you know, it, it will execute once for each entry in your table. So for every user, uh, you know, it, it, it creates a variable and it runs it as user. So, and I want to do, I want to say, what does it show for, uh, so I'm going to do a return statement here also, right? So I'm going to say return, um, again, this is JSX. So, you know, I'm going to say name is colon, 
user.name, right? And comma age is colon user.age. So whatever has been returned and comma email is user.email. So you can see how you can nest these curly braces also. So it's really useful in that. So I want to just return this. That is for each entry in my users list, do this, right? And that whole thing is in the curly braces. So, uh, oh, no, I've done something wrong here, haven't I? Um, sorry, let me just have a quick look at this. No, actually, sorry, there should be no semicolon there because it's not a function of, as such. So this should, actually like, uh, you know, and then on our, our return. So you can see how we can nest these returns. So this function would, uh, the inner function will return the JSX uh, and, uh, you know, with, with for each user. And because we've used user.map, it's like a for each function. So it's like a repeater. So once we do this, now, if we go back to our function, let's have a look at, uh, let's restart. Well, I need to restart the server. And if there are any errors, this is where it would get tracked down. Oh, okay. Uh, I haven't done the most important thing, which is like updating my index.js to actually show, sorry, my app.js to actually show my uh, my new item here. So I'm just gonna go back to there. Um, actually gonna get rid of this app header. I don't need a header tag. And I'm just gonna define, I'm gonna call my, I've got a user list there. Oh, what is this error? Which I need to do. Ah, because uh, there's one more thing I missed in the previous list. After I do all this, I need to make sure I export so that it's available. Here, I need to say import. I also need to do this in, uh, I need to make sure I uh, import the user list here. I shouldn't forget to do that in app.js. So import user list from, uh, what was it? it was, it's in the slash folder, so I need to make sure that it's there. So this would actually get my component, the user list, and uh, it would display on here. No, the set state function is, I, I will show you what that is for. Set state function is something if you want to use hooks, you don't need them if you have classes. I will tell you what that set state is there a little bit later on if we have time. Okay, so now if we come back here, you can see the code actually is. So this is retrieving this value from server and it is like formatting it using React. So I'm getting a list on here. I can also add on like, um, the last thing I want to just show you actually is like for input. So somebody mentioned set state. Uh, the set state hook is uh, is something more recent added. So like before we used to have functions and classes only and all this, uh, you know, setting state and all had to be done there. But uh, React in one iteration install, a, you know, introduce set state as something uh, as an, and a number of other hooks. Local host to local. 
Uh, I think you haven't set cores if you were getting that error request user. Just get a pull from the full uh, JITEC, uh, uh, the GitHub, and it should uh, fix that. Make sure you have set the proxy though. If you, if you can't set the proxy, uh, you can also just like, you know, come back to the code and, and, uh, and set it there. You know, like uh, that's just a convenience thing. If you can't set the proxy, uh, you know, you could come back to user list. Sorry, where was my command? Yeah, so, um, so instead of that, you could set it here like this. You could say HTTP, uh, sorry, HTTP localhost, blah, 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 the full URL. The only thing the proxy helps you do is that you can just say slash users. So it directly gets you there. So as you see, we've been able to do a get request. So this is in effect, this is our modern stack running. We've been able, we've gone from the middle, uh, like we've gone from the endpoint, uh, you, you know, we've gone from uh, our client side makes a request to our server. These could be in separate uh, separate machines also, right? Like the separate development servers. And so we've managed to come through. And so we've actually done like a full stack app just by this one simple function. Uh, one thing before we end up uh, with, with this part, I do want to also show you, um, No, cores you only need to set on the back end. Cores on the back end is good enough. That will take care of all the issues. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's also use like, so we had also set up the post. So let's set up our page so that we can also uh, directly. Now, somebody had mentioned hooks. Like I said, I'm going to use state hooks here, in which case, uh, so rather than setting up a separate component like I did here with user list. I'm going to just do it in app.js or, or JS directly. Okay. And the way state hooks can be used in, uh, sorry, uh, hooks in general can be used in uh, functions directly without needing to be bound with class. That wasn't the case before, but now you can do this. So now how am I going to do this? I'm going to modify this. First of all, I'm going to set up uh, something to, uh, you know, directly You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set up something to insert user. So I'm going to set up a div that just sets insert user. And I'm going to set up a few text boxes there. Uh, one is just like it's text. And I'll put a placeholder as name. All right. Autocomplete is also another great feature here that you'll see there. Uh, And this will be the placeholder for age. And we'll do one for type is equal to uh, text again. And placeholder is equal to email, right? And I'm also, what did I do that? And I'm also going to add a button that will that will actually. So I'm just, you can see how this is, this is one way to work with uh, React. Like you can just create an interface before you actually set up any functionality on it. Uh, now, if I go back, you can see I've added like these buttons. So these are already there. So, and uh, these values are there. My button doesn't do anything right now because I've not set it up, but I can directly set this up here. Now, what I want to do is, I want to actually create, I want, I want the, when I, when I hit the button create, I want it to actually create user. So I'm going to use the on click function and I'm going to uh, on click. I'm going to just define a function called create user, which I haven't created yet. Okay. Um, also another thing, since we are, we're going to be using Axios directly here. I want to make sure that I import Axios from Axios in this file also. We had only used it in the component, which is nice and modular, but because we're using it directly here, I'm going to create that here. Okay, so uh, now somewhere above like, uh, within the function, I'm going to actually do something, uh, I'm gonna create, so I'm gonna create that create user function here. Again, you know the syntax, you're familiar with it now. Right, and I'm going to just call. Well, I'll just do post and dot then. I'm not even going to do a catch. 
So that would make the error disappear. Yes, it is efficient to use script tags in a component. Well, in a component, uh, see all the script tags, whatever we're doing, we're only working with a virtual DOM. So React is actually quite efficient when it comes to you know modifying and using render. So it is not modifying render, uh, you know, directly on uh, you know on the DOM itself like Angular would. So it is quite efficient, I found, uh, and you know I've heard. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Okay, so uh, I've defined the create function, create user function. So when the click user is called, this, this function will be called. Okay, but we wanna actually like do our, uh, what are we gonna set for our post uh, command? I, we want our endpoint that we wanna use is user slash add, right? And um, we have to give it a body, right? So using the, same path, let's, so we have a new name, comma age, let's just say zero. These are all just default values. We've not hooked these up to the uh, text boxes yet. And what will we do in the response? Uh, let's set up our function. Let's just do an alert, you know, so we, we won't bother with anything too much. Uh, we just say user created. So an alert is just a box, so it'll just pop up. So let's not worry about that. So this will post to user, user add, and it'll send, it'll send that payload name, age, and email. We just set it to blank and it'll uh, it'll just call that function. So we've set up that hook. So when we click user now, it might actually give me a database error. So I'm not gonna do that. This one will actually be working now. So it will be doing that. What we need to do now next is that whatever value we put in here, we want it to be filled into these values. How do we do that? So for doing that, we're going to use state hooks, okay? Now state hooks can be used, like I said, in function directly, and you can read more about state hooks in the React thing. Uh, this is where you were asking, we should, uh, we should use, uh, we, we have to import the use state hook from React. Again, this will not be there in older versions of React. Uh, how we use state hooks are like, we're gonna set up a few uh, state hooks here. So within the function, so I need to set up uh, state hooks. Allow me to set up a few states in the within this within the the function itself. So I'm going to use set up something called set uh, a variable called name and a set name, which will be a state variable. What this does is that it says that uh, it says that this value is a state variable called name, and set name will set this value. So by doing this, by setting this this syntax, uh, and uh, the 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 double bracket just says that's the default value, right? By doing this, I'm going to do one for each of these, and I'll show you how I'm going to use it afterwards. I'm going going to do one for set name, for set age, right? Uh, because those are our three, three variables and email. So by doing these, I'm, I'm able to do this like rather than using it because those are required fields. Correct, I, that's why I did not click. So that would have violated those things. Uh, oh, okay, also because age is a thing, I should set the state to zero, the default state. Now, what this does is that it sets up a function. So now, I can actually like I don't need to, um, and this is a this is a particular thing. So since my state variables have the same value here, I don't need to actually say I can. This is valid. I can say name, name, uh, age, age, and email, email. That would be valid syntax. Uh, but when they are the same names, uh, there's there's a nice little feature, thoughtful feature that I can actually just remove that part and I can just say name age. So it just assumes that when the variable and the field name is the same, 
the state variable and the name is the I can just pass those values as it is. So I don't need to do that. But still, I have not invoked this. When should set name be called? And when should set age be called and set email? Now for this, I come back to the JSX. I need to set up on change events. So whenever any of these values change, so on change, I need to set up uh, a function. Uh, again, I will do this that's so that it uses event. On change event, uh, what do I want to do when it changes? I want to just call set name and I'll do event dot target dot value. So this is this is just setting up a setting up a handler for this. And we are done with this. I'm going to do the exact same thing for the other values also. I'm going to set up on change events. And instead of set name, I'm going to do set age. And similarly here, I'm going to add and I'm going to do set uh, email, right? So what this does is when the value changes in the input text box, it will be calling this event and it will be setting the state variables that we need. Then once we hit the button, create user will be called and these name age values will be retrieved from state and put into uh, passed to the user ad. So let's see if it works. Let's see what it looks like now. I think we've done everything that we need to. So now if we come back here and if I go back here and I type say, uh, let me just say Jane, right? And let's put the ages. 20 and email again as test at test.com. And if I say create, it says user created. So I remember I did an alert that's there. Uh, unfortunately, we've not set up the hook so that it like it refreshes here. So we can just refresh the page. And now you'll see that we've managed to insert into the database also. If we go back, sorry, if we go back to our database and we look at the users, you'll see the values are there also. Oh, uh, sorry, press the wrong button there. Let's go back to Atlas. But you can see our table. From here, and you can see that's these commands have been put in there. If you look at object, you can see that two items have been added in our database. So this way we've set up, I mean, this is pretty much our whole workshop minus the Stripe part. Uh, we have managed to set up an end-to-end. -end. So we have, see all the parts we've done. So this is, we've set up the client that communicates with the server the endpoints and the server does all the database work. So these could be, in, again, like I said, different servers and it communicates with the database. So we managed to set everything through. Uh, we can just uh, fix that up. I did discover one error in the, I'm just going to fix that. Um, there might be, uh, do check back on the GitHub afterwards. Uh, okay, so we've kind of run out of time. Uh, I'd aimed like that we wouldn't go over two hours, but we did go over two hours with this. Uh, and I, people are free to, free to leave. I'm happy to actually do, there is a part I can show you how to use the, uh, the Stripe, but it is gonna take a little, maybe another 15 minutes. Uh, so if you guys wanna hang about, I can definitely explain the code to you at least. And then I can share it on GitHub also. After the session, give me about 20 minutes and I will upload, uh, so say by about 7.30, I will upload the code for uh, Stripe as well onto the GitHub and then we can work for it there. But I can quickly explain it to you here also if you are still waiting around. I'll just quickly show it rather than on there. I had actually created two folders already. Um, so these are modified versions with, uh, so I created a client final with Stripe and a client final with without Stripe. I'm gonna show you how it works. Um, I'm gonna kill these two terminals for now. I'm going to kill this one as well as this one because we've kind of demonstrated everything that we want. So I'm going to move over to the versions with Stripe 
which I've got saved elsewhere. And again, like you can, you can do lots of things with this. So I've killed all the terminals. Let's come back to, I'm just going to show you the last part. So I have modified the code in Stripe. Now in Stripe, the great thing about Stripe also is like you can use a uh, test mode in Stripe. So it, you know, you don't have to actually use credit cards or anything. And I've already created something, uh, uh, you know, if you activate an account in dashboard with Stripe, just make sure that you are like, this is what you would see on home. Once you've created your account, I'm not going to actually create anything. I'm going to just go, you just have to make sure that test mode is on, uh, on Stripe and just go to developers. When you go to developers, you want to go to API keys. And there are two keys that you will see there. Uh, I don't care about these keys because this is test mode still. So, you know, I'm happy to show it here. There is a publishable key, which we can go into your front end. And there is a secret key, which goes into your back end. Ah, okay, I got logged out. Okay, so these two keys have to be put into your code. And I'm going to show you exactly how they're put into code. Uh, I've already done it for these two. In the server, this is how you would modify it. Okay, so I would have to create, I created a new root in server, right, with uh, stripe router.js. Uh, so this is a new root. So, like I created users.js, I created a new root. This is where I have to put the secret key. So, right after, uh, require Stripe, and I just put that. And of course, I, I have to require uh, like I did with the other ones. I've also used another library. By the way, there are a few things that you have to add on here. I, I've added on a couple of dependencies. Uh, you'd have to do npm. Um, let me just open up the terminal and show you what's in there. So I did. Uh, you should do uh, cd server final with Stripe. So on here, you should do uh, you should do npm install um, dash dash save Stripe. Of course, we need to use Stripe, and uh, there's a thing called UUID. A UUID gives, allows us to generate unique identifiers, which we're going to use for every payment. We need to provide that to Stripe. So UUID is there. So I've already run this, and that's why you'll see it's already there in the dependencies in, in the, no, no, JSON. So when I upload this uh, to source control, you will get that automatically. Now, coming back to the file, let me close this one. Let's come back to our Stripe router. What I did was I set up an endpoint like we did before called slash pay. Okay, uh, this, is, this is slash pay that all it does is, I mean, it, you need to, I generate a, a UUID and I have to save it. This, this variable name, you have to save it as this. So remember we said the variable name, if it's the same, you can pass it as a thing. This is the variable that name that's actually expected. Item, item potency key uh, there. So we are generating a UUID and uh, assigning it there. Uh, by the way, this is the line for using the UUID. Uh, the constant, the token and amount we take from the body, the request body uh, that is coming back from Stripe and we create a customer and then we set Say so then we charge the amount, amount star 100 USD, and we give the customer ID and a receipt, and then with a, just a then result that we just say, okay. So this is all we need to do to actually do a payment, to set up a payment endpoint on the Stripe uh, router. So obviously, you know, once I've set up the Stripe router, I need to add it also here. So like I did there, uh, you know, with the thing I've, I've, just, I've just done, const use stripe router requires dot root slash stripe router and add it to the app that use and so it is added on and that's pretty much it for the server side of things okay on the client side of things which i've got in let me just do and go to cd client final with stripe on the client side of things uh, you have to add uh, a few new, uh, there's a, there is a, you do NPM, oh, sorry. You do NPM install, uh, you have to install uh, a Stripe's own checkpoint called checkout. That's the only control and it'll, it'll, it'll actually give you a module. So once you do that, you'll see in package.json, it's added as a uh, React Stripe checkout. 
Now, how to actually use that is like you would modify this, uh, uh, what's it called? You know, you would, you would go to app.js in source. You import Stripe from react-stripe-checkout. Uh, and then you have to actually do, uh, you have to add as few of this thing, uh, a function called const handle token. So this is the token that gets returned uh, by, the, by the, the, the thing. And once it actually works, it, it calls dash swipe slash pay. Remember that is your end endpoint on the user, uh, sorry, on, the, on your server. So it calls dash swipe, dash swipe slash pay and it passes the token ID and the amount. We've hard coded the amount here to 100. In this case, uh, we've done a token handle and we say handle token 100 and uh, the token, we just automatically send it out. And then it'll just alert and say payment done. We then modify also, we added a, uh, another div and the div, we just add the Stripe component there. And this is where you add the other Stripe key. This is the Stripe key, which is the publishable key, which can go into the front end. So you can add it here and the token we just get from the token handler uh, function that we've, we've given on there. So by doing this, this actually gets, and if we actually run it, let's see what it looks like. So if we do NPM start, oh, before I do that, I have to actually start up, uh, let me set up another terminal for, for the server. Oh no, I have to do others first and then do that CD. CD others, CD server, final with Stripe. Uh, once I'm in here, I want to say npm start here also. So then it'll run my node mon. Okay, so my server is running and, oh, I think somebody was saying this is the error they were getting, right? Could not proxy users from local 3000. Hmm, this was working earlier, so I'm not sure exactly why that is. Okay, uh, this error comes up because localhost 3000 wasn't set up. So I'm going to just start it again. I should start up. So somebody was facing this error before, I think, where you said could not proxy request. So that happens if your server is not running at the same time. Okay, so now uh, we've got the same thing that we had. Like uh, I've set up a, a button here. So this was, remember, this was from the, the from the Stripe. So when I do pay with card, it automatically gives you this. Um, again, I'm in test mode, so I'm just going to uh, put in, like, say, the assembly 2013. The card number you want to put in for default is just 44. You know, this is a dummy card number because you're operating in, uh, you know, in mode, and you can just give any value. This is not because we're still in test mode. It doesn't really matter. And then if we say pay, it gives you an X, but we should also get an alert payment done because if it means now, how do we know that the payment has actually gone through? Uh, we haven't got any errors. If we go back now and we're in test mode, so we can go directly to payments. So it's successfully sent. So this is the one I just sent at February 24th, 6.54 p.m. So this is how you can incorporate Stripe using pretty much a similar style that we did in Mern otherwise. So using Mern and Stripe, this is how we would go about this. So this code is not on GitHub right now. Give me till about 7.30 and check back your GitHub. I'll post this on GitHub. I have to fix a few errors that I spotted on the base one also, and I'm going to fix those and I will upload that as well. I'm going to stop sharing now. Can you use .env on React so that the Stripe? Mm, suppose you could, but React 
It does. Uh, it might have its own version of that. Uh, so it might not be necessary because React has a lot of stuff where you can store directly on there, the public key. Uh, I'm sure there's a way to do environment variables in React also. Okay, I'm going to just uh, stop my sharing for now. We pretty much got everything here now that we needed. So that was our workshop for today. Uh, I'm sorry, we did run a bit over, but we, you know, we had a lot of material that we definitely wanted to get everything through. Uh, we'll try to edit it a bit, you know, like there are of course some things that we can get out and bring it into one hour uh, when we actually do the release version. But thank you all for joining us. So like I said, this is the first of our workshops uh, targeting startups and startup related innovation. Uh, we are going to be doing more topics like this. And as I mentioned, the next workshop is going to be live. Uh, it will be live and hybrid. So we are going to show you, uh, you, you know, you can turn up at in five and you can also follow along like you've done here. Uh, we are going to be doing that. So please do join us for that. We will announce the dates very shortly. So do have that thing. Thank you all for joining in and have a great one. And uh, we'll definitely see you next time. All the best. If you have any queries, as Lipik has mentioned, please do uh, send us a request. And I can be reached at lab at theassembly.ae or workshop at theassembly.ae, and we'll definitely get back to you. Uh, do give me half an hour, and I will upload all the uh, the code that we uh, that we have onto this. And yeah, uh, like I said, this is collaborative learning. We do a, a, we don't claim to be experts on the topic yet, but we just want to give you a little push. But feel free to reach out to us if you want to, like, you know, we, if you don't know, we will definitely find out and, uh, and do that. Uh, there's some great resources, by the way, for this. I would say the what we've done differently today is that instead of React only, where we were client side, we managed to set up an end-to-end -end server client app, which is a pretty big thing. In the old days, when I was coding, you would have to use PHP, you'd have to probably use if you use ASP.NET, you might have to use JavaScript and HTML and a lot of different things. And here we managed to do it all in one. Uh, and it can get quite complex once you do that. So please do keep trying that. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Bye-bye.